the storms passing across the the other mountain. I mean, it was like a it was like a scene from a movie, which is fitting because we were shooting the movie. But sure. um, but yeah, that in, but the entire area is like that to me. Um, it wasn't just Hadley. Hadley just happened to be the the place where that happened. I mean, I thought you know just flying around the high peaks wilderness was. I had the same the same uh, feeling, and then up in the the uh, Lake Placid area where we were toward the end. You know, I had the the same uh, the same thing happen there. It was it it seems like anywhere I go there, and it's been like that since the very first shoot. Um, I, I remember when we shot Beast of Whitehall. Now, this isn't obviously Whitehall, sort of at the base of the Adirondacks. I don't even know if it's not within the park. It's right at the the outskirts of the park. But um, when we were when we were in Whitehall, we would go out to A Bear Road at night and do do um i don't know what we were doing we we're just kind of hang out out there there was no reason to be out there we were done shooting you know like so we're just hanging around avery road but i had the same thing happen out there i i always say like if i could buy like a second home somewhere i'd buy a house on avery road um right outside of whitehall i just find that that whole area feels very very much like home to me um I don't know if it's the fact that there's amish there and i'm, <laughs> and I'm from <laughs> um but yeah, it's a, the whole the whole area really inspires that that feeling of uh, of peace. I guess I don't know. Sure. I don't know how to describe and and that incident. You know, like that whole that whole climb. You you have to be careful, or I I feel like I have to be careful not to make it too, too dramatic or whatever. But they're really, I think it it wasn't just for me. I think a lot of the crew felt that way when we got out there. But there was a. Uh, that was a really special time for all of us. And we don't talk about it all the time. It's like, uh, I know Mark who's in the movie shares photos from that on, on social media all the time. That was like one of, one of our favorite small town monsters memories. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, John and I live here, so we're always out and about, but in 2020, I mean, that was like the story of 2020. This place was busier than it's ever been. And it was mm-hmm. because of exactly that, like people needing to get out and, there's something about this park that, uh, you know, brings that sort of release and peace and block out all the noise um, right. in an amazing way. I also want to say that you guys did a really good job in the film. And again, maybe I'm biased because I live here in the high peaks, but you did a great job, you know, like building up to the point when you are finally getting to the high peaks region. Um, right. And I'll be honest, it got me super stoked and amped when I finally saw the high peaks and you guys had those helicopter shots and it was just like these mountains in all its glory. And it's like, yeah, this is why this is where I live and this is what I do for fun. And this is why Jonathan is out doing 20 mile days, eight days a week out in those mountains. They're just, you know, it's it's really just mind blowing when you get to see get to see the high peaks and how big and rugged they are from from a helicopter in particular and it really yeah. shows like the the size of this place and again that's just that's just the high peaks region you know that's just like a little yeah. chunk of what the the park is and i do think because you guys talked about it a lot and you really you really hit it on like this place is just so big and your film in my opinion for even someone who lives here in grew up here uh i thought it showcased that very well so kudos to you guys yeah that's super cool dude yeah because what we so there's there was an earlier cut of the movie where i did an exact you know exactly day to day what we did and, what we did. and the problem was the oh, final day we were in the high peaks but we were basically just kind of tooling around shooting gear, and it didn't quite you know like from a from a dramatic standpoint and a narrative standpoint, it didn't make sense for the movie. It's kind of like it, the movie just kind of petered out at the end. And what I, what I did is I, I was like trying to figure out from, from a storytelling perspective, the movie is about obviously Bigfoot, but it's also about the Adirondacks in general and that part of the country in general. And, and throughout the story that the high peaks keep coming up, but you don't, you don't necessarily see them. And I was like, you know what, let's just move the helicopter flight to, the final day and kind of let that be the, the big culmination of the movie. Originally what, what happened is the day that we did the helicopter flight was actually like day four, or day, three, day three or day four. And it was, I, I don't think we'll ever duplicate the insanity of that day on another shoot. We, we started with the 90 minute helicopter flight to the high peaks. Then we drove to Kinderhook 
and did all the Kinderhook section stuff. And then we drove to Western Massachusetts and did all the Western Massachusetts filming and the night hike and then drove back to Troy, which is where we stayed that night. And that was all in a single day. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, even that in the movie, just it seemed like way too much crammed into one day. But the movie is really about introducing people to that part of the country. And uh, it made it it made so much sense to move that helicopter flight to the final day. And the helicopter flight, just trying to get the footage was kind of a nightmare. Like I know Alex's gimbal just broke almost immediately after takeoff. And so he was he was doing handheld in the backseat a lot. Um, mine, my, my gimbal was catching the wind a little too much. We didn't have anything mounted to the helicopter either, by the way, it was all like, we're literally holding gimbals in the front of the helicopter, uh, trying to get those shots. And so some of the stuff turning out as well as it did was, was, uh, shocking. Like the, the shot where we, uh, kind of go around the summit of, of Marcy is, is, I mean, that's literally me holding the gimbal out the side of the helicopter. And it, I think it turned out fairly well. There's a little bit of wobble, but it looks really good. But yeah, I, th- I think that's such a cool, it's such a cool thing to, to have a movie that revolves so much around the place. And, sure. and I, I hope that's the biggest takeaway for people. I think it, I think it, it landed in that regard. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I so one thing that I absolutely love uh, that you addressed well in the movie was like you know the the whole idea of Sasquatch being in the Adirondacks, but let alone kind of funneling it back into the high peaks. You know, I think a lot of people overlook that because a lot of people never um, they never put two and two together and you know it's like obviously there's a lot of people that hike here and it's like oh well if there's you know 60 million visitors in a year it's like well how come none of these people are seeing sasquatch or this and that and whatever but it's like when you like you were saying earlier when you really think about the vastness of this place uh those people are not they're only on trails you know and when you look at the amount of trails within this place it's probably I mean, I would go to say, I don't know, there's probably a hundred times more miles of trails than there are roads, you know, here. Um, And so I just kind of wanted to get your take on the idea of Sasquatch coming down and funneling in from all these wilderness zones up here in the Adirondacks versus um, possible migratory patterns as well from Vermont into New York and into Massachusetts and that tri-state area. And are they of yeah. the same, like, you know, like kind of just curious to what you've learned, like what you learned out there. And with well, yeah, the, when, when we were making beast of Whitehall, that was the first time I heard about the, the, the quote unquote migratory routes, migratory. When people hear that migra- migration or migratory, I think they think a little larger or broader scale than what, what we're talking about. Um, cause we're not talking about a massive migration from like North to South or East to West or anything like that. We're talking about a, you know, a range that they're traveling localized. around. Yeah. A localized range that they're, they're, they're kind of traveling around this area and utilizing specific locations based on the seasonal changes. And, you know, the habitat in those areas might be more suited and, and bears do that. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. something that other animals do that we know that animals do um so i think the idea is that and again this isn't my theory i'm kind of just putting out there what some of these these investigators have learned from looking at the reports over the years but yeah there seems to be a pattern that appears that that does correspond with the seasonal changes and so you've got uh sightings that are happening in and now that I'm starting to talk about this, I'm totally blanking on like what, how the seasons exactly fall. But I think it's like the, the coniferous forest, right. should offer some shelter from the cold. So you see more sightings in those areas during the winter. Um, you see more sightings out toward like the high peaks and that kind of region during the summer when it would make more sense for them to be heading there. So those like, kind of things, and they do kind of, the sightings follow the rivers and the waterways. Like there is absolutely, no doubt. And what that means is that means there's a Bigfoot. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying sighting reports follow waterways. And that's, something, just, that's just how it works. I 
totally didn't think I, I never thought about that until that statement was brought up. And when I think about it and I gather every single account, every single account, account eh, can't talk account and encounter uh, that I've heard here, there's always a body of water. Uh, yes. There's canoeing, driving alongside of the uh, driving alongside of the rivers, um, experiences of hikers being by bodies of water. Uh, like and, Jimmy. Well, yeah, like Jimmy. And, and even just um, like, oh my God, I think like nine times out of 10, there's some type of water source involved with these reports up here particularly. Well, I think that's mm-hmm. the, I mean, the Adirondacks, that's if, for people, let's say you get people out West who come here and they go hiking, nine times out of 10, their first thing they say is there's so much water here compared to what they're used to. You go to Colorado, there's not nearly the the abundance of rivers, streams, and lakes um, that there, that there are here in the park. Um, so like, that's always what I always hear from people who are coming here for the first time from out west is their first thing is always talking about the amount of water here. Um, and I think that's probably, and again, you know, I... I've said for years, and I have a million reasons why I feel the way I do, but another just reason why it, it just makes logical sense for something like a Sasquatch to exist here in the ADK is because the water, the green, being able to hide, it's pretty much Tens of thousands everywhere. of lakes, tens just of thousands so of miles of rivers. Yes. Um, so yeah, the crazy, that was that was one of the things about that that flight. Uh, the helicopter flight that was that was so crazy for me was the amount of uh, lakes on those mountains. Um, you get you get sure. up there, you know, and, yeah, and that, I don't, yeah, yeah, and I'm sure you guys have climbed those mountains, but I don't know if you've ever uh, have. You, I'm assuming you guys have got to like fly over those those areas before. I have. I've taken out a lot of airplanes to do aerial shots yeah. and stuff like that up there, and I've yeah. been to a lot of those alpine lakes up above four thousand feet. Um, as well, and there's a lot of remote ones. Okay, I'm, I, I have a question for you guys. Then, like, are there areas, especially in that high peaks wilderness area, are there places up there where you think people have not yet been? Like to find places. Like I would, I would say, like some of those mountaintop lakes, especially because I'm curious how many of those areas have trails going to them, or how many people have actually bushwhacked to the top. Like, are there? In the High Peaks Wilderness, are there locations where you think people have not yet set foot? So in in the High Peaks Wilderness, I would say when it comes to a known uh, source of water, something that looks like, I don't know, let's say you could put a boat in there. You know, mm-hmm. I would go to say that I, I would say it would be hard to find something that no one's ever been to um, mm-hmm. because even though there's hundreds of... Uh, and, and thousands of these little lakes and little ponds and stuff that you just see remotely. I know there's always someone who's gone up to that spot. And most of these places have names and a lot of them don't actually, uh, they're not on public record what those names are. Uh, mm-hmm. But I do know that there are for sure square mile sections um, that for at least hundreds of years since Native Americans, like there's no real like, uh, there's probably no one maybe alive at this moment who's probably stepped foot on certain areas of those mountains because like you said there's no trails in a lot of these areas and if you go on a bushwhack between two high peaks generally there's a standard route following drainage following river and there's no reason whatsoever to deviate off that course i don't know a mile to the right when there's there's no gold there's no there's nothing out there and you know again i i can't you know there's been uh, thousands and thousands of people before us who are pioneering because the Adirondacks are new. They're fresh yeah. to society. You know, uh, the first reported high peak ascent was in 1797. And that's like not that long ago. And so who knows what Native Americans were doing back then. Um, but there's definitely a lot of areas that, uh, I, you know, like the size of a football field, at least that I would say probably um, – I would say there's definitely a low, low chance that someone's ever stepped foot right there. And I think you'd, you'd also be one of those things where even if you take those areas or those crazy remote ponds or whatever, I mean, it does, it would seem surprising. To, it's like one of those things where people have probably been there, have more than a dozen people been there. Right, that's the probably thing. Probably not. There's most but, likely at least one person who's been to yes, every single body of water you But has there been see. 10, 20 people? Right. That's where I'd be, I'd be like, probably not in, in yeah. like the scheme of things. And you, you really nailed it too, Jonathan, when you said, you know, 
nobody would have a reason to go a mile this way. And sometimes off the that's people's reason. The drainage. Sometimes sure. people have the sure. reason. I've I've done that before myself. But when you when you take into account that possibility, it's like yeah, there's. So-